Well, it's been a while since we last looked at Hebrews. We've had Easter and uh, Noel's been away on holidays. And if you can cast your minds back, um, probably about a month or so ago now, Wayne shared with us um, on the first few verses, the first six or seven verses of Hebrews chapter 3, where he encouraged us and just declared to us the fact that Jesus, greater than Moses, has been faithful as a son over God's household, that we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. I'm not going to try to give a summary of the, the rest of what we've done, but just, uh, I guess, a few phrases or headings of some of the, uh, the chapters that we've looked at or passages. Jesus, greater than the angels, made a little lower than them or than God for a while, but he's the one who is the radiance of God's glory, the one who is crowned with glory and honour in order to suffer death so that we might have life. We've had an exhortation not to drift away, not to neglect our salvation. And Jesus, again, who was made perfect through suffering, is not ashamed to call us his brothers. He's a merciful and faithful high priest, but we are his friends, or and we are his friends and his brothers. And way back in Hebrews 1, the first verse or so, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. And so today we come to Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7, looking at the rest of this chapter. And we come to a passage where we're told, where we're encouraged. It's a quote, yes, but it's to us as much as it was to the Hebrews and to others before. Today. As the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the rebellion. God speaks, doesn't he? He has always spoken from creation and he will always go on speaking. Do not harden your hearts as Israel did, we're told here. Israel was saved from their enemies, from Pharaoh and from the Egyptians taken out of Egypt, led through the Red Sea and they're brought to the very edge, the southernmost edge of the promised land of Canaan. Most of us will know the history and James in the extended reading we got, but probably not his fault, I made it very confusing. We heard even more of it than what we needed this morning. But most of us will know that story and all the while there from Egypt through to that time, most of the time all they did was grumble and complain against Moses and against God, the one who led them out of slavery, the one who freed them, the one who provided for them with everything they needed, the one who kept their clothes and their sandals from wearing down, and they grumbled against him. It wasn't the sort of grumbling that you get when you're driving a long way with your kids or next week at Oruru, are we there yet, Dad? There's at least a little bit of hope in that sort of grumbling. We're going to get there, but when will it be? Now, the Israelites, it wasn't like that. It's more like, what have you gotten us into? We were better off back then as slaves. All we're going to do here is die in the desert. We'd be better off if we did. No hope. No thankfulness. What we heard in our first reading from Numbers was only a part of their grumblings. But let's go back and have a look at it, if you have your Bibles there. Twelve spies had been sent to check out the situation. They were at the border, at the, uh, at the edge of the Promised Land, and they sent out spies to go check it out, see what the land was like and what the situation was. They come back 40 days later with an accurate report of the situation and of the land. But only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, brought back a report and a course of action that came by faith. The others, it was all by sight. The land was great, yes, it certainly does flow with milk and honey, but you should see the people there. They're huge. They're powerful, and there's lots of them. We can't go in there and take that over, no way. We're like grasshoppers in our own eyes and in theirs. So, those spies, those ten spies, spread a bad report about the place amongst the camp, amongst the Israelites. 
whereas Joshua and Caleb reported back saying, we should, yes, go up and take possession of this land, for we certainly can do it. Don't be afraid of the people there. The Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But at Numbers 14, the beginning of that chapter, we hear what the people did. They didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb, they listened to the others. That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud and all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and against Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt, back there? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Ever heard yourself saying things like that? Maybe not to do with Egypt, but things like, if only? Why me? Wouldn't it be better if? We should choose a leader. We should take control of the situation ourselves. Even after all God had done for these people, miserable, thankless bunch of no-hopers that they were. Yes, they were God's chosen people, but I don't think that's much of a bad summary for them. Miserable, no joy for where they were, where they were heading, thankless, and no hope for what was ahead, for what was promised to them. They had no hope because they never bothered to remember what God had already done for them faithfully in the past. Nor could they look ahead to what God had prepared for them and promised them for the future. After all he had done on the very edge of the promised land, they want out. They want to take control of it themselves because they cannot see the hand of God. They will not listen to his word. They still don't know God's ways. This is why in Hebrews we're told, this is why I was angry with that generation, says the Lord. Their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. Even after all that time they've spent together, God with them in the wilderness, Moses did know God's ways and he speaks to God on their behalf. Have a look at verse 17. Moses is saying to them, if you put these people to death all at one time, then the nations are going to hear about this and they say, what sort of God is that? So Moses says to him, now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. That time up on Mount Sinai stuck with Moses, didn't it? when the glory of God passed by and he heard who God was, what his ways were, what his nature was. So he says, in accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. All this while God has been forgiving their wickedness and rebellion and sin. But they still don't know that. They won't receive his love or his forgiveness. They will not hear his voice. Their hearts are hard. And what's more, even at this point, Moses goes back and declares God's judgment upon the Israelites and they hear some of it because they turn and say, yes, okay, we've sinned. And at verse, take it from 39, a verse of chapter 14, Moses reported this to all the Israelites and they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning they went up toward the high hill country. We have sinned, they said. We will go up to the place the Lord promised. But Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Don't go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. And so on. There's an acknowledgement of their sin, but there's no repentance. There's no hearing the voice of God. And instead there's presumptuous and arrogant disobedience. We're going to go up anyway. If that's what he's brought us here for, then we're going to do it in our own strength, in our own arrogance, presuming upon it all. 
Now that's just the background to what we read in Hebrews in chapter 3 verse 7 onwards. But what we actually read in Hebrews is actually a quote not from Exodus but from Psalm 95. Flick over halfway between Exodus and Hebrews and you'll probably find about Psalm 95. If not, find it anyway. This is where our passage from Hebrews is quoted from and it's written by David some thousand years later than the Exodus. But it starts off as um, on Tuesday nights we've been sharing about these things and Sarah Dingle's just said to us, this is a call to worship. It's not just a warning. Psalm 95, the first half of it is a call to worship. It's a wonderful thing to see in the midst of warning. We're worshipping and serving God. But have a look at why we're called to worship in the beginning of Psalm 95. Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation, the one who is strong and sure. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Why? For the Lord is the great God. He's the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his and he made it and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us kneel down in worship. Let us, sorry, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Why should we worship this God? Because of his ways? Because he's the shepherd? Because he's a creator? Because he's our salvation? The ways of God? We must know those ways and because of those ways, because of who God is, we worship him. So what we read in Hebrews is a quote from there. So let's have a look at the text itself in Hebrews 3. Why is it that now these Hebrew believers are being encouraged and warned with these words from Psalm 95 which refer back to the Israelites back in Egypt? Why? Are they showing signs of turning back to Egypt? No, but they are showing signs of turning back, back to the old order of things, the old worship, the old covenant, They're neglecting the rock of their salvation, Christ. They're in danger of neglecting him, ignoring their great salvation, drifting away, things that they've already been told and exhorted not to do, warnings for them. They're in danger of drifting back to a justification by works, back to what I'd call the default position of the flesh, apart from Christ where they have some control, where they have some say in the matter, or at least where they think they do. Again, does it sound familiar? If only. Why me? Wouldn't it be better if? And so the Hebrew believers are hearing it for them back then. But for us here this morning, what day is it? Sunday, the 30th of March? It's today. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. This word is for us here today as much as it was for them then and for them back then. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Last week I had the opportunity to go get some petrol. Took the girls to school. It's not often I have to get petrol first thing in the morning, but uh, we had one sick child, so I got to take the other one to school. Ducked in a hand off to get some petrol and it was early and the guy hadn't had a chance yet to put the numbers up on the, uh, the price sign. I said to him, oh, any chance of it being free this morning then? <laughs> he said, no, no, I just haven't had the chance to get out there. So, fair enough. And he said, I've always thought about putting a sign up there though. Free petrol tomorrow. It'd be good for business, wouldn't it? He just kept the sign up there though. He says, it's not tomorrow. It's tomorrow. It's today. It's always today, isn't it? When does God speak to us? apart from where we are now. In our present situation, whatever the circumstances, today he speaks. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. 
Do we come to church each week expecting to have a good time together, sing some good meaty hymns, share in some good fellowship and a cup of coffee afterwards, hear a good word to spur us on to the next week? Or do we come expecting God to speak to us? Do we actually expect to hear God's voice? Because if we don't, we may as well be down at the golf club or at Rotary or somewhere else because that could puff us up and encourage us along the way for a week, couldn't it? But God speaks. He speaks a message to each of us. Christ himself speaks to us a message that brings faith. And it's with that faith that we hear God's message to us. Hard hardness might well begin just with being dull of hearing, not actually expecting to hear God speak. Or perhaps it's mere indifference. doesn't matter if he does or he doesn't. Life's going to go on, no matter. But in the end, I think hard-heartedness shows itself up for what it really is and always was, as arrogant, presumptuous disobedience, born out of sheer unbelief. Have a look at Hebrews 3, verse 15. As has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Hard hearts were those who sinned, those who disobeyed, unable to enter his rest because of their unbelief. Knowles mentioned it up here once or twice before, but it was Luther who said all sin is unbelief. Not just not sure, not just doing something I shouldn't have done. Sin is unbelief. Now there's not much danger of your eye drifting back to a sacrificial system of worship. I don't think so anyway. Or to any of the other Jewish customs. Not much danger of us wanting to head back over to Egypt unless it's perhaps as a tourist or on a mission or a pilgrimage. But there is the danger of our hearts turning hard, isn't there? Of us being deceived by sin and therefore being hardened of reverting back to that default position of the flesh, wanting to take control. Remember the grumblings of the Israelites. And I think most of you were centred when I said, do they sound familiar? If only. Why me? Wouldn't it be better if? We should get together and choose a leader. Take control of things ourselves. Do you ever feel like you want to take control of your life and feel like you could really make it work much better than what it's actually doing? For many of us it takes lots and lots of times of trying that to learn that it doesn't work. Lots and lots. I think most of us are still learning. Ever feel the need to go and justify yourself? To go and try to undo something you've done or to do something you should have done but didn't? That's what the Israelites are trying to do when they said, OK, we've sinned, we're going to go up there anyway. Trying to make up for what they'd done. I don't know if any of you saw the movie Atonement. The story of a young girl who did something at the time, not really aware of the, the consequences of it, but then spent her whole life trying to make up for it because it had a significant impact on a number of people's lives. And as an old lady, the last scene, I might spoil it for you, I don't care. In the end, I won't spoil it all, but in the end she actually realises that there's no way she could atone for what she's done. She cannot make it up to those people, no matter what she tries. She tries to fool herself in the end, but in doing so realises that she can't even do that. We cannot make up for our past. Do you ever worry about your future? Or maybe even just tomorrow. Did you hear God speak to you this morning when Winston started off with Philippians 4? 
Don't be anxious about anything. You ever try, try to tell someone who worries a lot, who suffers from anxiety, not to worry? You better duck and weave pretty quick and try telling them that that comes out of their disbelief of God's word and promise. It's a hard word to hear. It's a hard one to say too when you know it's true. But God tells us not to worry. Don't be anxious about anything. I clothe the fields. I look after the sparrows. Cast your cares on me. I promise you, I'm faithful. I'm a father who knows how to give good gifts. Hope doesn't disappoint us. The hope we have in Christ. Because God has done something. He's poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Because our past has been taken. It's been dealt with. We don't have to take it up and deal with it ourselves. It's been taken upon the cross. Chatting with some Year 11s and 12s at summer school back in January and just sharing with them about things of life and just at one point said to them, you guys, your whole mindset is about this number at the end of Year 12 called a TER, Tertiary Entrance Ranking. And schools, the way that they do it, everything is pointed towards this magical number which is going to be the cause and the root of their destiny. I said, it's rubbish. Christ has your destiny in his hands. And a couple of masters said, oh, really? <laughs> that was so good to be reminded of. They knew it. But the mindset when you're studying is just so much on that's going to work out how, what I do next year and what I do following that. No, it doesn't. I can't even remember what my mark was. Six months after I finished, it didn't matter. Christ, God, the Father, has our destiny in his hands. In his heart a man might plan his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Do you ever find yourself falling back into that default position of the flesh, taking matters into your own hands? After, it's all, after all, it's your own hands that have worked hard to get your paycheck, to pay the food that's on the table, to pay off the increasing mortgages. Is it really? Is it your own hands that have done all that? Or have you ever made sure you've got a contingency plan in place just in case God doesn't come through with the goods? Faithful, but got a plan B in place just in case. Is it faithful? Or perhaps... You might just seem, or things of life seem just too big to face up to, too overwhelming. Have you ever felt like a grasshopper compared to what God's put before you? If God's put it before you, he's pulled you there and he's blessed you so that you might serve him. And if any of that is you, then I think I'd say join the club. And to be honest, I think we'd all say it's all of us, some of the time or most of the time or all of the time, because there are other voices out there, aren't there, apart from God's. There is another word, just as there was in the garden, trying to deceive us, trying to harden our hearts. But to all of that, God's word is there, speaking to us gently in love, but very strongly, living and active, saying, do not worry saying, I'm faithful, saying, I will direct your steps, saying, we have a faithful and merciful high priest who's taken our past before God. It's been dealt with. They're not just a string of Bible verses or phrases, they're the ways of God, who's loving and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love to us. So today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Know God's ways. Know that he's faithful. Know that he's merciful. Look to the eyes of God as Noah did and there you will find favour and you'll find grace. Because we all do feel like those things, don't we? 
taking things into our own control. If only, what if that, why me? And it's because of that that the writer of Hebrews, I think, actually tells us to encourage one another daily. Not just when we're at the bottom of the lows, not just when life's hard, but daily to encourage one another so that we're not hardened by sin's deceit. Because the deceit is that we take it bit by bit and think, no, it's all right, I'll just get myself together, I'll get back on track and I'll be okay. Just let me get a bit more sleep or just a little bit more money, I'll be okay. Let me get my life organised. Who's getting whose life organised? All me. No, encourage one another daily. Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceit. We have come to share in Christ. And he calls you his brothers. And I can call you beloved brethren. So we encourage one another daily in love, in gentleness. We too have actually experienced God and his ways, have we not? Moses spoke to God and in one sense tried to remind him of his ways. You are slow to anger and abounding in love. Perhaps he should have spoken to the Israelites that. But no, they had actually experienced it firsthand. And so have we. God is faithful. He is love. And we can approach him at the throne of grace with confidence, not presumptuous arrogance, but with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And would I dare to say that our time of need would be today and tomorrow when that becomes today and the next day. So hear his voice because he speaks to you today and encourage one another daily and believe the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, living and active, for your life-giving word, and we thank you for Christ who speaks to us by your spirit. Father, we ask that you might grant us the faith that comes from hearing that word, the message through Christ Jesus, that we might know you, that we might trust you, that we might believe and obey you and know your ways each and every day. Father, we pray that we might be able to encourage those around us and we know that you've placed people around us to encourage us. Help us to hear them, to hear you and believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.